Is this working? Yep. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Siebenrock for a wonderful symposium. Um, the discussions are excellent and presentations very illuminating. I'm going to discuss uh, femoral epiphyseal morphology after the modified Dunn procedure. I'd like to thank my co-authors. So um, there's incontrovertible evidence that slip capital femoral epiphysis, if untreated, leads to osteoarthritis of the hip. Most of this comes from the Heyman Todd collection in Cleveland, and some comes from untreated slips from Iowa. And we now understand the pathomechanics that create osteoarthritis. We, there's an epiphyseal rotatory translation. This leads to decreased um, anterior femoral head chondral depth in the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum, a large metaphyseal prominence with a cam-like morphology, and posterior periosteal new bone formation that can affect the posterior aspect of the joint. In situ pinning for six decades has been the uh, standard of care, at least in North America. Uh, there's many long-term follow-up studies that substantiate uh, good results in the vast majority of patients and poor results in patients who have attempted close reduction or realignment surgery. It is acknowledged, even in these older studies, that the results do deteriorate over time in proportion to the severity and complications. So there's some more modern clinical outcomes data from three continents, substantiating that a significant portion of patients who have slip capital femoral epiphysis do have pain in middle age. Hansen showed that 42% of uh, patients in his series had radiographic signs of OA. Pablo Castaneda had a 22-year follow-up study on a fairly large group of patients. He found radiographic signs of osteoarthritis in all of these severe slips. The degree of deformity was proportional to the presence of OA, and OA was, present, was proportional to the Harris hip score. And uh, Larson at the Mayo Clinic looked at a fairly large series of hips at midterm follow-up. 12% had already had reconstructive surgery, and one-third were complaining of chronic mild pain. There's also good radiologic evidence of recent publication that substantiates femoral acetabular impingement as a mechanism for damage. Uh, Freitzel looked at 16 uh, patients with mild slips, all had ele elevated alpha angles and radiographic evidence of FI, FAI. Dodds in Ireland looked at uh, 36 patients six years after pinning, and a third complained of stiffness and pain, and a third had clinical signs of FAI. Zilkins did some excellent radiologic studies looking at patients at midterm follow-up. 92% had radiographic signs of OA, although these signs did not necessarily correlate with clinical symptoms and outcome scores. And uh, they documented that the alpha angle uh, corresponded to the presence of articular cartilage damage on MR imaging. So all this data has made the modified done a more attractive procedure. We have increasing evidence that there is hip dysfunction following in situ fixation of slipped epiphysis. We now have a much wider array of acute and chronic reconstructive options. And the modified Dunn procedure is increasingly employed for both acutely and chronically displaced slipped epiphysis as it enables us to correct large deformities at the site of the deformity. So this is a typical case. This is a patient with a acute on chronic, severely displaced epiphysis. We did a modified Dunn. And in the early years, as long as the slip healed and there was no osteonecrosis, we would high five one another and consider this a success. But on further follow-up, we see patients coming back with significant deformities of the joint. And this is a concern, and this is what prompt us, prompted us to do this study. So we had three questions. Does the epiphysis remain spherical following the modified Dunn? What is the morphology of the upper femor femur following the modified Dunn? And could we identify any predictors of this abnormal femoral growth? So we had 39 patients treated with the modified Dunn. The mean follow-up was 21 months. The mean age was 12 years of age. Most of these patients were male. We classified the slips temporally and by stability. We looked at the pre and post-op AP and lateral epiphyseal angle. We assessed the hips postoperatively using Mohs sphere, sphericity scale and the presence of a vacuum sign on a frog lateral. And we looked at the post-op AP and lateral alpha angle. There were no AVNs in this series. Statistic, statistical analysis was done to determine independent predictors of the lateral epiphyseal angle, lateral alpha angle, and AP alpha angle using stepwise linear regression, and binary logistic regression was used to examine the effect of the independent variables on the presence of a vacuum sign and head sphericity. And we considered the independent variables to be sex, age, length of follow-up, temporal classification, and the load or stability classification. So these are our results. Uh, we had 
13 acute slipped epiphysis, uh, 30, or basically a third of our hips were acute slipped epiphysis, and two thirds were either acute on chronic or chronic. And if we look at the stability index, the vast majority were truly unstable hips, meaning unable to walk. So the post-op lateral epiphyseal angle was significantly higher in the stable patients, which is what you would expect uh, given the, the deformity of the femoral neck that has to be accommodated for uh, in the reconstruction. We sought to answer our questions. Does the epiphysis remain spherical following the modified done? So at an average follow-up of 21 months, there's a high incidence of aspherical morphology using Moses method. So 80% of our hips were aspherical on follow-up. What is the morphology of the upper femur following the modified done? We found significant correlation between the al AP alpha angle and the length of follow-up. So the longer we followed these patients, the more deformities we noted at the head neck junction. This is a typical patient, as you can see, uh, with a large cam-like deformity of the femoral head neck junction. There were no significant correlations between the pre-op lateral epiphyseal angle and the post-op lateral or AP alpha angles. And age was found to be the only independent predictor of the AP alpha angle in this study. So this study certainly has limitations. We have a high number of acute on chronic slipped epiphysis with large established neck deformities. And we have a low number of truly acute unstable slips. I think that um, similar to what Professor Siebenrock presented. And this study is limited to radiographic follow-up only. We do not have uh, clinical outcome scores. What are the possible etiologies of the deformities we are observing? Well, I think that to a large extent, the epiphysis is very diseased in many, in many of these patients. You can see this patient, uh, this is, you know, there's significant uh, damage to the articular cartilage. The head is actually very misshapen. The posterior aspect of the epiphysis is very soft, and it's just a very, very sick head. The other potential explanation is that these patients develop a lot of periosteal new bone beneath the flap that contains the retinaculum, especially in the patients who have more severe deformities that require more r surgical remodeling of the neck. And the other possible explanation is that we have non-anatomic reduction on a deformed femoral neck. I mean, you can get pretty close, but in some of these um, deformities, it's not possible to make the hip look normal like you can in a, in a truly acute um, slip. So this is uh, conflicting information uh, that has recently been published in the literature. This is a large series of long-term follow-up studies uh, from S S Texas Scottish Rite Hospital. And what they found was that BMI, not the residual slip angle, was the only uh, predictive factor of um, hip outcomes. And this is in contrast to a recent study published by Eduardo Novais, who in a series of severe um, stable slips found that the modified done was doing better than in situ pinning at short-term follow-up. So this, um, at least for me, raises uh, qu questions regarding the application of the modified done procedure. We see a high prevalence of epiphyseal aspherosity and developing head neck cam-like deformities in our patients. The incidence of the deformity is definitely increasing with increasing follow-up. These findings suggest to me that the epiphyseal growth is abnormal following reduction, and we do not make it normal by the modified done procedure. And I have a concern regarding long-term clinical follow-up, especially for the severe chronic slipped epiphysis. Thank you very much. I will come.